So I want to welcome everyone back from our quick 15 minute break and start the first panel, which will be confidence in elections. On this panel will be Mitchell Brown, professor at Auburn, U Auburn University, Andrew Sinclair, assistant professor of government at Claremont McKinney College, and Charles Stewart, founding director at the MIT Election Data and Science Lab. One of our many responsibilities of election officials has been educating the public about the voting process and safeguards in place that ensure the results are accurate. Now, more than ever, these processes of faith in the dedicated public systems who run elections have come into question. Elections are inherently transparent and bipartisan, as um, Senator um, Blunt mentioned earlier. From the management of election locations to the storage of ballots and equipment through the certification process. Communicating with the public about the nuances of how elections are run is more important than ever. But election officials are already stretched thin with the vast responsibilities of actually doing the work of managing elections. It is my hope that this panel will not only discuss why confidence has decreased, but also recommending and recommendations on how election officials and others can turn this tide. Joining this panel will have some noted academics, as I discussed earlier, who have done research on elections and public sentiment of elections. To begin, I would like to ask each panelist to take a brief time to give opening remarks on this topic, and then we'll dive into questions. With that, I would like to start with uh, Professor Brown. Thank you very much, and I want to um, thank the EAC for hosting this important event and for inviting me to be a part of the panel and for Pepperdine University for hosting this. It's the most beautiful campus I think I've ever seen. Besides um, Auburn, I would hope. Besides <laughs> Auburn, yes, you're, you're right, you're right. <laughs> Auburn University has one of two graduate programs in election administration in the country. And our faculty also serve as the curricular faculty for the professionalization and certification of election officials program for the past 30 years that's run by the National Association of Election Officials or the Election Center, um, of which one of our afternoon panelists was the longtime executive director. In addition to the training and educational programming we do, we also work with election officials to produce and disseminate research and information to support their work. As I'm sure everybody here knows, the use of disinformation is not new. It has been around for about a century. But what is new is its use in a social media environment that's characterized by incivility and the use of algorithms designed to engage people in content that they react strongly to, um, which is magnified disinformation's impact as a weapon in a new way. Simultaneously, what we know is that the spread of misinformation about elections has been tremendous and no less insidious. And so election processes and by extension election officials have been a target of this and we've seen it take its toll on the profession. At the instigation of the election officials we work with, for the past two years the faculty at Auburn have been collecting messages that election officials have produced from around the country to try and combat misinformation and disinformation. This summer we ran a series of focus groups with regular people from around the country to test some of those messages that election officials produce and we're now in the process of running national panels uh, on some of those messages that worked best in the focus groups. Our, our findings to date suggest that some of the best practice advice about messaging to combat mis and disinformation that's been used actually doesn't work as well as intended in this current environment, um, but, but some of that does work very well. The best example and most positive results I can give are from messages that remind the public that election officials are just like them, that they're relatable, that they're neighbors, that they're their friends. Uh, the Issue 1 campaign that came out this summer featuring election officials is a great example of the type of approach that we had positive findings from. I will say as an aside, um, with 
Commissioner Hicks's permission, we used his picture on some of the messages that we tested. And, and while they like the messages, nobody has any idea who Tom Hicks is outside the people in this room. <laughs> Just my mom, basically. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Mom. Um, we also know from working with election offices around the country that some of the offices have capacity to produce high quality and well-targeted messages to combat misinformation, but most offices around the country do not. Um, as such, this is combating a misinformation and disinformation environment is not something that we can expect election officials to do on their own or in isolation. As we have done this work and watched the environment emerge, I would say that I think we're in a, a, a period of democratic existential crisis. Um, a lot of the advice that we are getting is that we need a whole of government approach to combat this. I think our work suggests that what we really need is a whole of society approach to combat this where government works with other kinds of groups to address these problems. From our work, I would say that chief among them are the political parties. Political parties are not a part of government. They are private organizations who, whose mission is really to control government and policy by having its members elected to office. And um, really think that we have to get the parties, both of them, to commit to supporting the system that we have in place that has appropriate checks and balances and effective checks and balances to ensure integrity rather than capitalizing on misinformation in order to fundraise. Um, and, and I would add that this is not a Republican or a Democratic problem. We know from polling that voters of both parties distrust elections and government when their candidates lose. And we know from 20 years ago when the events that led up to Hava's passage happened that the Democrats had similar responses, though not to the same extent that we're seeing now. We also see watchdog groups as a part of the equation and they have to be a part of the solution. They're an important part of legitimate democratic functioning as a check on corruption, but the upside down environment we're working in makes a lot of the work they're doing run counter to what we need. Uh, there are a lot of other groups that must be involved in this, business among them, the media, education, churches, civics groups, and all of this has to start with the commitment of the leaders across the country of all these groups to work together with government. And I'll close by saying that um, this is a marathon, not a sprint. There's no quick fix, uh, but we have to work across party lines to help our nation prosper and to get over this moment. Thank you, uh, Professor Brown. And next up, we'll have uh, Professor Sinclair. Well, thank you. And I'd like to also start by thanking the EAC for organizing this event, for having me um, working on this important topic, and also to thank the people who work in election administration. It's very easy to sit at my desk and think about what you ought to do better, um, but it is very hard to do it. And it's a challenging environment to be working in. Um, it's important work for, of course, sustaining democracy. It's largely thankless, and it is, uh, I think, more difficult perhaps than it has been um, due to the informational environment that we're in. It makes it a less pleasant and, and much more stressful job, I have to imagine. Um, so thank you for your work. In general, I think anyone who studies political behavior would tell you uh, that there's this broad consensus that many people look at the world through sort of partisan tinted glasses, and that's just the nature of human beings. Um, but not everyone is well represented by the worst email in your email inbox. Um, and the nice thing about democracy is you don't have to get everybody on board all the time. You just have to get enough people on board enough of the time. So you know, how can we get there? And particularly, is there something that can be done about the conditions in which misinformation uh, might flourish? So I'd like to make three points about that. So sort of broadly, of events that happen um, somewhat upstream of uh, when the election administration actually takes place. So first, I'd like to endorse what you just heard about a, a whole of society approach to the problem. And my particular research interests are largely in political reform, and so I would add something else to that, um, that we need an all reform community approach as well. Um, that there are lots of advocates working in areas that set the conditions in which election administration takes place. One of my particular interests is in different types of primary elections. And it's interesting to think about the way in which different choices that you make about 
um, how you structure electoral competition can then influence you know, what you have to administer. So for example, in California, um, we use a nonpartisan top two election procedure, which is very, very simple. Um, in the first round in the primary, you vote for who you want. Anybody can vote for anybody that they want for an office. And then the general election, you do it again, you vote for who you want between the two choices that are available and the person with the most votes, votes wins. Um, as you may have seen in the news, we just finished counting um, in an Alaska special election, uh, which operates on a different kind of election rule. Uh, Alaska has now adopted uh, essentially like a top four followed by a ranked choice voting rule, which is just a little bit more complicated, right? And there are advantages and disadvantages of, of each of these different kinds of systems and the other ways we conduct elections across the United States. But those set the, the conditions under which the public is going to interpret election information, right? In some systems, it's a lot easier to understand what the outcome is uh, than others. Secondly, in, on the theme of you know, what do we ask of election officials, um, there are other considerations that are dictated by the, the broader political circumstances um, that influence things like how quickly you can count the ballots. And that the long delay uh, in counting ballots can provide a window for people to sort of make mischief in, uh, when there is, in fact, absolutely nothing wrong at all. And I think I'm not alone on this panel in being concerned, for example, that if um, control of the U.S. House of Representatives comes down to a handful of U.S. House seats uh, here in California, California takes a very long time to count ballots. And so it could be that for an extended period of time, um, control of the majority in the U.S. House of Representatives could be uncertain. And that's the sort of environment in which people can then um, you know, sort of raise concerns and, and uh, you might think is, is sort of mischief making. Um, and that's a choice in part based on how we conduct elections in California. Um, we're now using a, a large reliance on uh, mail ballots and their advantages to doing, to doing things that way. Um, but it's, it's built into those decisions. Uh, third, in terms of describing the general political environment, one of my interests uh, recently has been to investigate this theme of rising populism in the United States. And amongst other scholars working in this area, there seems to be a sense that there are different strains of populism. And some of these have a kind of anti-democratic character to it, but not all do. Right? Some have a kind of a uh, Mr. Smith goes to Washington feel to it. And that, that is a sort of sentiment that is potentially useful uh, for people interested in election administration, where you can say, look, you're, you just want things to work well. And we're going to give you a pitch about how things are going to work well. And that in this environment, it might actually really be possible to ask for what you think would make for better election procedures uh, as an expert, make that pitch to the public, and uh, see if you can actually convert that into uh, support for actually better procedures. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. And finally, before we go to questions, I'd like to ask Dr. Charles Stewart from MIT to make a few more remarks. Um, thanks, Commissioner Hicks. Um, as Doug Lewis would say, uh, <laughs> inside joke. Um, uh, I also wanted to start by, um, by thanking the EAC and Pepperdine for hosting this, this event. Um, um, it's much more beautiful here than MIT, I will say that. <laughs> Although as a Stanford grad, we can have a, we can have a conversation later on. <laughs> um, it's, it's great being here. Um, as a point of personal privilege, but it also gets to the point of this, um, of this um, panel. Um, Commissioner Hicks was a shilling for a career in election administration earlier on among the students. And it's oftentimes said in an election, no one gets into election administration, no one in election administration started in election administration. It's oftentimes said. Um, people get sucked into it or, uh, and then find they really like it. Um, and that's oftentimes true in the people running elections. It's also the case for academics like myself who get into studying elections. Um, 22 years ago, I was a professor at MIT who was known for studying political history, um, quiet times in American politics, say before the Civil War, when um, Congress was at each other's throats and those sorts of things. And the election happened in, 20, in, in 2000, rather. Um, did I say 2020? I, I meant 2000. Um, 2000, um, and then things happened, and um, some of us got pulled in together at MIT and Caltech to begin studying the technology of elections to try to make sure that a failure of technology that was at the center of the 2000 election 
wouldn't happen again. So since the 2000 election, I've been studying technology, but I've also been studying the attitudes of voters and um, what brings them to trust the outcomes, what gives confidence in the outcomes of elections. So my perspective is, first of all, the historical one of watching the public um, change in how they view elections over the last 20 years, but also the kind of the political historian in me who knows that in the 1950s there were similar um, issues of trust in government all the way up and down in the pre-Civil War period in the 1880s and 1890s, and certainly in other times in American history. And so we can use the modern tools of public opinion research and the analytical tools of his, um, political history to come to some understanding of these questions. So I have a few points that I want to make. They're, they're consistent with what my colleagues had to say, but here's my particular spin on them. The first thing um, is that um, um, we oftentimes make the mistake of conflating the public when we're thinking about trust in elections. Okay, so um, I've read a lot about this topic over the last few years. I've gone to a lot of conferences about this topic over the last few years. And the question is always, how do we get the public to have confidence in elections? And I think the first thing we need to recognize is the public is a they, not an it. And the public is divided into certain segments where we need to be thinking about studying what's moving um, public opinion there or opinion there if we want to do anything to make things better. Okay, so most of the research that we've been doing over the last 20, 22 years has been about the mass public. It's been about voters. It's been about the 180 million people or so who vote. What drives their confidence in elections. And there we, ha we have some pretty robust findings. Um, as has already been mentioned, we have two big findings. And I, I oftentimes tell election officials, if you want your people to be confident, um, make sure of two things. Make sure they have a good experience on election day, and make sure that their candidate wins. <laughs> um, hopefully, you can only have control over one of those things. right? Um, but that's what we find in the mass public. Now, what appears to be different right now is that not only do we see divisions, oftentimes partisan divisions that are related to kind of the winner and loser effect, but we're also seeing emotion being interjected into those opinions. So it's no longer, say, even four, six, eight years ago, you would see Democrats and Republicans flipping in how confident they were given the outcomes of elections. And then the unconfident ones would say, well, you know, Chicago, they have, you know, they kind of you know, tell stories about someplace, someplace else um, as driving. Um, and, they, and, and they were just kind of grumpy. I just call them grumpy. Um, the distrustful now are not grumpy. They're angry. They're disgusted. They, are, um, engage, they, they have opinions that tend to excite action of a different sort and it tend to incite action of a violent sort. And so um, you know, the nature of the public opinion has changed um, um, when you ask people these questions. And that a lot of the mass public is still just either grumpy or kind of generally happy about things. But there is a notable group of the public that is emotional now about the results. And it's that segment of the public, I think, that we are most worried about. Um, I would say, you know, w there's always going to be the grumpy mass on the losing side. Um, but now we need to worry about a smaller group of people who are motivated by um, other concerns on Maslow's hierarchy, actually. I, I was thinking about those terms, who are motivated by issues of belonging, esteem, love, those things at the top that get at the core of who, who people are as human beings. And that's a different thing than convincing people that, yeah, the election was done right. Okay, so we need to understand the different segments of the public to understand, first of all, the dynamics, but then secondly, to understand what the prescriptions might be to make things better. So that's kind of thing number one. Um, thing number one. Um, the second thing is that among the 
So one of the things I've been studying over the last couple of years um, in parallel with some colleagues who are studying um, conspiracies in general is that I think we need to remember, oftentimes, even before this concern about distrust, I, I've been encouraging people to think about election administration as part of public administration, not a special thing. It is a public administration. And I think we need to think about the strongest, most emotionally laden aspects of distrust as being related to not just distrust about elections, but distrust about a lot of things. Right? So the zealots, the people who are making physical threats against the public, the people who are being um, obstetrious at, I think that's the word, um, in polling places. Oftentimes, they're the same people doing the same thing in the public health um, office in the county, um, maybe in the police station, at the school board meeting, and in other places. So this is not just an elections thing. Um, it's a broader thing. And by addressing this just as an elections thing, um, we may be either overestimating our ability to address this problem or just missing the mark altogether. Okay, so, so some of the concerns about mistrust are not about elections. Um, and so maybe we not only need a society, um, an all society um, approach, but we may need an all policy approach, an all government approach um, to these sorts of questions. The final thing I'll mention, this is not about public opinion, and most of the discussion so far has been about public opinion, but it's a, but it's a think, well, what do we do? And usually in panels like this, um, we talk about um, you know, the strategies that election officials and others can engage in in order to communicate better with, with the public. And those are enormously important things. Absolutely must be done, and we can talk about those sorts of things. But there's another set of things that I call building trustworthiness in elections. And by trustworthiness, I mean being able to convince somebody who can be convinced that the election that was run was fair and the outcome was as determined. I think what we saw in the 2020 election, got to get these 20s right, in the 2020 election was the triumph of a trustworthy election system. Time and time and time again, when people would make claims about the election that they shouldn't be trusted. There was a judge, there was a Secretary of State, there was somebody who was bound by the law, by practices, by norms of democratic behavior, who said, ah, show me the evidence. Because there's all this evidence over here that the outcome should be trusted. And so, um, yes, we need to think about communicating with the public, the different parts of the public. But in this process, we also need to be thinking about the different ways in which we can build up a robust system such that when we know we can't convince some set of people, that we can at least convince the people who will say, you know, the judge or whoever it is, that yes, this is the right outcome. So I do think that 2020 was an example of what happens when it works well. Um, we have other things that we need to do around auditing, around um, observers in the polling places, and those sorts of things that I think that could build even great trustworthiness in elections. But the trustworthiness is important because we're not going to be able to convince everybody. And we need to think about what to do when that happens or doesn't happen. So, thanks. Thank you. Um, just, I would. Thank you all for your comments. I think the way that I want to start off with my first question is to start broadly. Is mis- and disinformation the biggest threat to public confidence in elections? Why and how is that measured against other threats like aging election infrastructure or the shortage of um, election personnel? Whoever wants to take it. I think Mitchell wants to start. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> yeah, I, I um, think mis- and disinformation might be the biggest threat to public confidence in elections. 
But, but I think we have other threats that are probably in the long run more important and that we need to spend some time on. And so having to address the mis and disinformation problem gets us in the way of supporting the election administration system as a whole. Um, issues like infrastructure, aging, and personnel problems are very real. Some of the personnel problems have been exacerbated by mis and disinformation. Um, but it, we, we consistently underfund election administration. It, it, it undergirds all of American democracy in some of our research on funding of election administration, because election administration happens at the local level. Um, we, we looked at county budgets and looked at election administration office budgets in all the counties in 10 states, and on average, we spend half of a percent of a county budget on running elections. And elections don't just happen once every other year. They're happening all the time, and election work is happening all the time. And we're underfunding it to begin with, and we have stretched limited resources now by having election officials having to become experts in uh, messaging and communication with the public, a, an area that they're really not experts in, and some offices are big enough to have PIOs, but most aren't. And um, the, the under-resourcing of election administration, I, I, maybe I'd pick as the biggest threat of, of what's happening in the current environment. Okay. I would, I would just second that, that um, to point that was made before about having trustworthy elections, the biggest threat is messing it up, yeah. right? Because uh, it's hard to convince people after a, a real actual triumph of election administration to trust their elections. And convincing them to trust the elections after you've messed it up is gonna be very hard. And so putting resources into making sure that it goes right is probably the most important thing to do. Um, and in the long run, the repeated success in, in that way should hopefully build um, increased confidence in elections. Because um, I think there's, there's a bit of a risk in thinking about the tr tr you know, public trust in elections, um, that we sort of imagine a past, like the good old days. Right? And the good old days may not have been that good in terms of trust, trust, actual trust in elections, right, from a historical perspective. And there's, some, there's some obviously new things going on in American society. Uh, today, but misinformation and disinformation is not actually a new, a new phenomenon. Um, and so I would, I would say it's important to dedicate the resources to get the outcome right. I, what, they, I mean, what they said, I mean, the material, I mean, um, you know, on the, the third thing I, I, I say to election officials in addition to the two to that I mentioned is sometimes that is an implication of that is that for election officials, there might not be a whole lot that you can do to make people trust the election, but there are things that you can do to make right. them distrust the election. Yeah. Um, you can have long lines, you can have the ballots not show up, you can have the, you can have the wrong poll books distributed. There are things that can be done. And uh, you know, the worse the administration, um, you know, the more, you know, the more you're struggling with resources, the more likely it is that those sorts of things would happen. One of the, I think the unfortunate I mean, there's a lot unfortunate about the current environment in which election administration is running right now. Um, and I think that one of the most, uh, one consequence of being you know, down <laughs> at the low part of the, of the hierarchy and worried about the physical security and safety of poll workers is that it is difficult to have conversations about how election officials, election systems can actually work to improve. You know, for the blocking and the tackling of running elections, um, and um, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and I've talked to Democratic and Republican um, election administrators around the country who would love to have that conversation, but their time is is filled up right now with just keeping people on board and dealing with this um, information environment that they live in. I'm going to add something. Please do. Yeah, I, I think the, the um, measure of a successful election isn't that nothing goes wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, because things go wrong in elections all the time. Um, and, and these are things that are outside the control of election officials. The, the, the hallmark of a successful election is that the election officials are able to recognize immediately when something's going on and pivot and correct it. And, and then be fully transparent and communicate that in a way that, in, to ensure that, that the system has integrity. And 
And so I, I don't think we want to hold up a standard that there's a perfect election where nothing goes wrong, because elections are, are characterized by things that happen all the time. B because you're working in a completely imperfect environment, you can control how many ballots you print and that the ballots are correct and you know wh where your precincts are if you've got precinct-based voting, but you can't control how people behave when they get there. And, um, and you can't necessarily control the lights or whether there's a car accident right in front of a polling place or things like that. And so it's that reaction to when things go wrong that I think is a measure of a really strong election. That kind of transitions into the next question I have in terms of uh, is the elections community better positioned today to combat mis- and disinformation as they were maybe 20 or 30 years ago? Since I'm the old the old fart here, I'll um, I'm gonna speak about 20 years. Absolutely, right. I mean, that's in fact one of the things I think that's due to Hava is that it accelerated the professionalization of election administration. Um, it infused the system with billions of dollars that's been talked about before. It raised the salience of election administration. Um, and you know the people I deal with now who are running elections at all levels of government are of a kind of different sort um, than 20 years ago. Although um, Connie McCormick was you know was was on the cutting edge of 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 this professional movement, but now we get professionalism at lower levels of government than than we, than we used to. So that's good. Um, I think there is one element that's already been touched on that hasn't improved, and that is still the reliance on outsiders and the smallness of the jurisdictions dealing with these issues. Um, you know, a, a century ago, um, there were 10 times more um, school districts in the United States than there are now. 90% okay, of the school districts that were around a, a century ago are gone. Now, why are there fewer school districts? Because public education got more complex, and that little neighborhood or town-based schools couldn't keep up. And so we saw the consolidation of school districts around the country. Um, I would maintain a similar thing has happened in elections, that things have gotten more complex, more dangerous, and we still have as many people running elections <laughs> now as a century ago. And that's a real challenge, I think. And um, election officials are doing the best they can, especially in the, in the really small jurisdictions. But I do wonder about the ability of the system really to, to meet the demands of the time um, when we have so many small jurisdictions. Um, and it's kind of the weakest link. The final thing I'll say, I, 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 I was, I noted several years ago, for instance, and when there, there was a, an intrusion incident into um, a big network of, of um, voter registration, big voter registration network. And um, it included all sorts of phishing attempts, um, sending people email, including to the election, um, I believe it was in American Samoa. Okay. Um, it just takes one jurisdiction can be a small jurisdiction to reveal vulnerabilities in the system. And so I think we need to think about um, small jurisdictions and whether, um, and this is no, no shade on small jurisdictions, just to note that the rest of government has been consolidated. And I think that continues to be a challenge and something I worry about. Great. Um, if, if we're going down the line, I, I would say build on that, the other thing to think about is not so much in, in relationship to the public directly, but in uh, the technology that's available to um, election administrators to demonstrate and check that things have gone well and to respond to uh, situations that come up and, and everything um, that in many ways the, sort of the good days are now, right? Um, I can remember one of my first sort of elections related projects as a undergrad, you know, you couldn't have a readable PDF. So if you wanted to analyze the election data, you had to go to the library and get the book of 
election results <laughs> and type it by hand into a spreadsheet, right? And it's just so much easier now to share data with lots of partners to demonstrate that, yeah, this, this you know, look, here's the file, here's how it works, you can run it yourself, you can do it on your computer, you can do all these kinds of things. And so the technology has um, created some threats, but also some really new great opportunities for demonstrating the competence of election administrators. Thank you all. Um, before we get to the next question, I wanted to comment, take uh, moderate a privilege to address two things. One, um, to the students in the room, uh, before Help America Vote Act came around, most people had to actually go to a library to get research done. You couldn't just <laughs> um, pop onto your computer and have things uh, scanned to you or, or emailed to you. Um, and that involved around the Dewey Decimal Center and all this other stuff that I'm aging myself. So um, that's one thing. And the other thing was um, Dr. Stewart had mentioned um, someone in the room, for those who are uh, watching this on video or live streaming now, um, Connie McCormick, who uh, started off in Dallas, went up to uh, San Diego, and finished up in LA, which is the largest jurisdiction in the country. Um, and we'll hear from her um, successor a little bit later, Dean Logan. But um, to for, for those who are not here, so she ran uh, three of the largest jurisdictions for voting in the, in the uh, country and also uh, was instrumental in the passage of HAVA for those who are in the room and who may not know who Connie McCormick is, uh, but also to um, praise those folks and give them their flowers as well. So just want to say thank you, Connie. Um, we were warriors together 20 years ago. <laughs> I was just 10. So, <laughs> <coughs> so with that, um, we will go back to, to, um, to some of the questions that I had. Um, and, and looking at where we are today in terms of uh, social media and, and other aspects, are social media companies doing all they can to combat mis- and disinformation? We're going to start in the middle this time, since or oh, oh, start with. I'll start. That's okay. fine. Yeah, I think the answer has got to be no. Uh, one of the one of the big parts of the problem that we're facing right now is about the algorithms that are used by them, and I don't know that it's useful to debate the merits of exploiting human psychological traits for profit. Um, it's a time-honored practice, right? Um, but, but, but in this case, the impact that social media companies' algorithms um, have is really literally destabilizing our country, and it's not okay. We, and, and we have precedent for getting involved. I, um, I imagine I'm one of the biggest defenders of First Amendment rights ever, but we, we don't allow things like subliminal messaging because it hurts people and it's manipulative, and w I think we have to have hard conversations about whether we regulate the algorithms. I mean, I, I, agree, I, I agree entirely. I mean, I do think, I mean, there's been a lot in the press recently suggesting that the social media platforms are kind of backing off a little bit in this election, and I'm not quite convinced of that. I think that the social media um, platforms are are engaged in a similar way as they were two years ago, but I also agree with um, what Mitchell said, is that they're not doing enough. And um, um, the one thing, caution I would add, though, is that um, we need to remember that social media is one of many forms of media that people um, consume. Um, and it's easy to make um, social media scapegoats. So as we're thinking about the, the communications environment in which voters live, you know, remember that you know, <laughs> they're, they're, they're paying attention to local news on the television, um, where there are, are, are newspapers still, and there are too few of them. They're reading those, they're reading local news. You know, they're doing a lot of different things. And so I think that one of the challenges now may not so be so much the algorithms, although they are problematic, but the fracturing of the media environment, in which case it's not really clear what you do in order to fight um, you know, bad information out there, because there's just so many places that a voter can go to get information. You don't know quite what to do to make it, to make it right. 
Um, if I could also then maybe add something building off what uh, Dean Peterson said in his opening remarks as well, um, that we shouldn't forget citizens and their role in this uh, process and to take them seriously. And so there's always this question about, well, is this organization or that organization doing enough? And then begs the question of, well, you know, who makes them, right? And it, these sorts of media environments, whether it's social media or other kinds of news, they exist because they're putting eyeballs on adver you know, eyeballs for advertisers, or people are choosing to use it. And if people don't like what a particular social media company is doing, you can also stop using it. And I think that there's a, there's a role for discussion about what citizens can do um, to actually shape this environment rather than just be recipients of it um, in an important way. That there's a role for everybody here. So I, can I want to add something to that? Yeah, um, one of the things that we found when we were doing the recruiting for our focus groups is that we were recruiting through the social media platform platforms that election officials use to message to the people in their communities. And frankly, we were hoping to get some of the angriest people. And um, we didn't. And we spent some time thinking about why not. And you know, I think one of the things that's happened but by shutting down certain voices and shutting down certain conversations on some of the social media platforms, we've pushed people to other platforms that, that's um, essentially doubled down on divisions in the conversations that are happening. And, um, and they're platforms that election officials are not using at all. And, and I think that's also a problem too and um, a, a real unintended consequence of the way we tried to tap down on some of the divisive language and, and a problem. Um. Well, I would say thank you uh, for that. Before we go to the next question, again, I would say for folks to get information to definitely go to the election, their local election website uh, for that information or go to other trusted sources like the Election Assistance Commission or NAS or the National Association of Secretaries of, of um, the State Election Directors uh, because those are three places that you can get trusted information to allow for yourself not to be informed by mis or disinformation. Um, building upon that, are there other Tool, effective tools used to detect instances of mis and disinformation, and are they accessible for election officials um, who are often mis or are under resourced? I, I would say that I, I don't think it should be the job of election officials to detect instances and sources of mis and disinformation. It's probably a job for law enforcement, it's probably a job for other parts of the federal government. Um, the job of election officials should be to be professional, to be ethical, to be accurate, to communicate that. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to push back on your question. <laughs> you're entitled. You're wrong, but you're entitled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would agree. <laughs> yeah, I think that that's a, it's a, um, it's a job that we can do. Right, as as scholars, is is to identify and you know what's going on and and try and explain it as a as also a trusted source of, of information. Um, so you can collect giant amounts of election data, right, and and make it available to people um, and explain what's what's going on. And and of course, there's, there's a role for elected um, election officials to be transparent about what they're doing and to describe it to the public. But I think there's a there's a risk of going too far down that that uh, hole of you know, trying to, to counteract this stuff instead of doing the main mission of, of executing the election. I think all that's right, although, although having, that having been said, I mean, there are the resources, and I imagine some of the other panels today may, may, may talk uh, about those resources, both in the government, like CISA has certain tools for reporting and following up on, on, on certain bad actors. They're in the, in the university space, Stanford and um, University of Washington and other other groups have you know, been monitoring um, social media um, um, internal to the United States. There are these tools for local officials to um, report things that they're seeing um, for, um, for those observatories, if you will, to, to catch things themselves. So there are tools there. 
Um, and I'm sure that um, Commissioner Hicks um, will, will note that one can go to the EAC website and find those tools and find those resources to, um, to, get, to get engaged with them. Yep, as our role has grown, so has our scope. And um, we do have a pretty good website that's, uh, that allows for a lot of information to be put out there, eac.gov. <laughs> Um, so, um, with that, uh, I wanted to build upon that last question in terms of effective tools and was hoping that one of you would erase the fact that those who are doubting the process and giving mis and disinformation could also become part of the solution in terms of um, serving as poll workers or election officials. Do any of you want to comment on that? Sure. Um, a hundred percent. We've seen in the past that when people who have questions and doubts get involved, um, their questions and doubts go away and they become real champions of the process that we have. Um, I, I, I would speak to my earlier comments. I think the people who, in a whole of society approach for addressing the problems of mis and disinformation, that it is the leaders of those groups that we have to connect with at first in order to have them connect with the people who listen to them and who trust them as their trusted sources in order to deal with this. Well, and, and just for the, uh, particularly for the students who are here today, um, it's a great way to learn about democracy, to go participate as a, uh, you know, a poll worker, to get involved in the process in some way. Um, I did it in grad school and it was, a, it was a really great experience. And it helps, I think, for the you know, general public to get involved to do that sort of thing not just because you learn about the process and can develop your own confidence in, in what's going on, um, but also because it makes the other participants humans. And I think that's just really important is for people across American society to see their fellow Americans as human beings who are doing the best that they can to make democracy work. Um, it was a really inspiring experience to work as a poll worker for me and I think for many others who, who've done it. Before Professor um, Stewart jumps in, I wanted to see if you could expand upon your statement earlier in relation to this question about there are other um, factors, other, other sectors that also have this sort of problem in terms of the people who are making these accusations of mis- and disinformation are also doing that at the, at the school boards and uh, at the police boards and things like that. So how are they also combating these, uh, this mis- and disinformation if, if you have an answer or comment on that as well? well to some degree, some of those folks are being dealt with by the local gendarmes. Um, that um, that the stories I am reading, I mean, some of the more extreme ones, um, are actually ones where law enforcement does get involved. Um, and I, you know, that is a conversation that we need to have, which is an unfortunate one because, as um, Professor Brown has been saying, we you know, <laughs> this system, you know, works when we get a wide variety of people in the polls. And um, I've personally seen what happens when skeptics get into the polls. I mean, well-meaning skeptics, um, they're almost always converted over, and so we need to think about that. But there are some folks who not only won't listen, but have taken, taken a mission really to disrupt the system. Um, and those are cases where law enforcement gets involved. Um, um, so I'll, 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 I'll just stop, I'll stop at that point. Um, otherwise, I think that we have a hard time um, um, you know, just understanding in general how to deal with people in universities have a very hard time understanding how to deal with people who won't listen to reason. I'll just put it that way. When you say people in universities, you mean students or the professors? Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, do any of you have recommendations on how election officials or others can turn this tide? I'll start. No, no, no. I'll start. I'll start. I'll start. I'll start. You're the closest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, thing number one um, to election officials, um, um, consistent with what's been said here, I think thing number one is election officials do your job as well as you can. I, mean, I think that's the most important thing. Um, elections are hard to do. There's a lot of details. It's a job that I can never do because I'm a slob and I'm, the, I'm, 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 I'm um, you know, I can't organize my way out of a panel um, or anything <laughs> like that. Um, it's, it's a special calling, it's a special job. 
and the best you the better best you can do of that job, um, it will go a long way to making this a trusted and trustworthy um, um, process. Um, a couple other things I haven't been mentioned. I do want to mention one that's been um, mentioned a lot within media, and that is to develop relationships with the press and the media. Um, and I'm thinking here not necessarily about social media, but thinking about local broadcast media, lo local print media, and online media. Um, um, there are very few reporters, there are more now, but there are very few reporters who, who cover elections as a beat. And it's a constant job to reach out to kind of mainstream sources to make sure they understand what's going on so that they can serve the editorial um, function of sifting out the things that make sense from the things that don't make sense. And so um, that's something um, that can be done. I know a number of places do it. Um, but I, that, I think, would be, is really, really valuable. Get to know who the reporters are. Get to know who the editors are. Um, invite them for lunch. Invite them into the office on a regular basis. Do a petting zoo for the, you know, to show them all the equipment. Do those sorts of things to, you know, to really help them understand the process when things, um, when, when things happen. Um, and um, d don't rely just on yourself. You know, we've talked about this several times before. Um, a lot of election departments are small, and just take advantage. I um, mean, don't be distrustful of opportunities uh, that are happening in the state with, with local universities, with local nonprofits to help you um, deal with um, the issues. So those are some thoughts. I guess uh, my closing thought on this is just please don't quit. <laughs> right, like there's a, in the face of great unreason, which you will encounter in American politics from time to time, <laughs> right, um, there can be a sense of, okay, well, there's just, I'm not going to convince people to trust the thing that I'm doing, so I'm, I'm not going to try. And I think it's, you know, in some ways we've been talking about different publics, right, and there, there is a persuadable public, um, and at, at both sort of an elite level and at, at a mass level, and there are great divides across beliefs right, within these kinds of different coalitions of, of people from different perspectives um, where they will have really different beliefs about how elections ought to be conducted um, at times. And it, it's really hard to bridge those and to make a compromise about how you think you could actually do something to improve elections. Um, and I think doing the really, really hard work, not for the people who are just implementing the election, but at the, at the policy making level about how are we going to conduct elections in American states doing the really, really hard work of trying to find compromised positions that actually make everybody feel better that's in this sort of persuadable range um, is just really, really important. And so I would encourage you to keep working at that. I'd say all of that's um, right. I'll, I'll then address my comments to a, a more sort of drilled down area around this, and that's about how election officials do their communicating with the public and the messaging. Um, what, what we found in our research is that, and, and to address the multiple publics idea, um, there are lots of different communities you're talking to and you have to talk to them in different ways and one size fits all communication campaigns don't work. Uh, some of the most sophisticated and best messages that we took from election officials that they had created. Um, that, that I thought were brilliant um, absolutely fell flat when we talked to people who weren't from that community or from the demographic of the person who put them together. And so even election officials who work in small offices have other people they can talk to and in, in working um, across generations and groups of people to think about what people hear and how to talk to people and and using various platforms and talking to people in different ways with different people is probably um, a, an important thing to do. Great, great. I think um, I'm going to ask uh, Melissa from uh, Pepperdine to start collecting the questions from the tables that folks have. Um, but in the meantime, I would go back to, I wanted to um, publicly thank um, Senators Klobuchar and Blunt for their remarks on the uh, 20th anniversary of the Help America Vote Act. And um, 
uh, their work together on a number of different issues. And also to thank uh, President Bush for, and, and his wife Laura to, for the kind remarks that they also put down there um, for, for the passage of HAVA and the anniversary um, that we're about to approach on October 29th. Um, so hopefully folks have filled out um, these cards. Uh, we probably won't get to all of them um, in the brief time that we have left, but I will uh, um, read a couple of those um, and see where we go. And hopefully folks have better handwriting than I do. Um, so I am going to shuffle so that no one says that I... <laughs> playing favorites. Um, and, um, and one of the things that since we've been doing this earlier, um, we will, um, the first question will come from um, someone who's attending the school here. Um, Abigail. So she wants to know what constitutes a mis or disinform what constitutes mis or disinformation that would negatively affect the elections process. So basic question. So well, I any kind of messages that um, the system's been rigged, that you can't, you know, that that there's some kind of giant conspiracy, that there there's all kinds of fascinating. Um, messages, some of the 2016 messages that, that folks who study this determined were, um, ca came out of Russia, you know, with the intent of destabilizing us um, as a nation really were messages that, uh, w where they were double down, doubling down on cleavages that already exist, so racial tensions, class tensions, um, party tensions. That all of these are the kinds of things that we're seeing. I'm sure you all can add lots of them. Um, so I, I would say that the thing that's most important to focus on are things that are sort of obviously untrue if you know how the system like, works. So you know, you're looking at how the, how the ballots come in and how the vote totals are, are reported and so on. And th there is an explanation for you know, why this candidate got these votes at this time or, or so on and so forth. Um, and then for someone to persist in messaging something else about that that's sort of obviously untrue, um, that's the, the sort of the most damaging of the, the kind of disinformation um, un in terms of undermining the specific trust in, in how the you know, votes get tabulated. Yeah. I, mean, the, the, I mean, the types, I mean, some of the types of, of mis and disinformation um, especially just um, incorrect information about elections um, is kind of good old-fashioned misinforming people about how and where and when to vote. Um, and we forget, I mean, it's kind of dumb, um, but it still happens of, you know, folks, um, and, it's and, and with kind of the algorithms, it becomes easier to target, you know, adherents of the other party and slip them information about the wrong time to vote and those sorts of things. <coughs> so, you know, that's kind of the classic Thing that could really <coughs> mess up and really mess up an election. I think that um, another thing that we have our eyes on um, are so-called deep fakes, or at least the um, the use of visuals that um, claim to illustrate things that they actually don't illustrate. Um, and this isn't a deep fake, but but uh, as an example of misillustration. Um, a classic example was the Fulton County um, um, so-called ballot dump in 2020, where there were charges of <coughs> election officials pulling, um, you know, you know, pulling ballots out of suitcases and kind of dumping them. And when that was in fact, you know, pulling ballots out of a, you know, a a a, um, a sealed box. That is how um, these things are. Um, these things are transported from you know, the warehouse into the counting facility. Um, and um, well, that illustration, if you're inclined to believe um, that things were rigged, a, an illustration like that taken out of context 
can be very powerful because a large number of people are, are swayed by pictures, right, rather than, rather than just the words. And if you can just say, ah, you know, here's State Farm Arena, you know where that is, and you know what they're doing, and look, there's a suitcase, and look, they're dumping. I mean, that can be particularly powerful. So I think that that's one of the ways in which it's a particular challenge right now because of multimedia um, that can kind of hit all the senses um, um, to um, you know under under undercut um, trust. Uh, this question comes from Grace from the Bipartisan Policy Center. Charles mentioned that there were similar levels of low public confidence in elections during the 1880s and 1890s and during the 1950s. Are there any lessons learned during those time frames that can be applied today? Uh, I guess that's for me. Grace. Um, <laughs> so I've been, um, I've been reading um, a lot of things from the 1950s actually recently. Um, and um, you know, remember there was a social movement that grew up in the 1950s that claimed that Eisenhower um, was, a, was a communist plant. Um, and um, it kind of kind of went from there, and um, it was an important movement in this country for a number of years, and then it fell apart. Why did it fall apart? Well, one of the reasons it fell apart was eventually political elites came together to dampen it down in various ways, and so um, so then so then thinking about kind of this total <laughs> societal total reform approach to this question. I mean, it seems to me that if we want to think about what are the conditions under which we get out of the current um, malaise, um, well, the 1950s tells me that you eventually turn things around when the kind of the trusted um, kind of political leaders decide they want to turn it around. So um, in the 1950s, um, and, and this is where kind of the, the, you know, the, the, the history of the conservative movement in the United States is an important <coughs> one to, to look at. You know, the rise of William F. Buckley and the National Review and all those sorts of things can be thought about as a movement among you know, political elites who understood the corrosive um, effects of you know, what it does when you think the president is a communist. Uh, and when it's coming from that side of the, of the political spectrum. And so at some point, so that tells me under these conditions, at some point we need to rely on leaders <coughs> to come in and provide the messaging that yes, you know, we fight about various things on a policy level, but we can assure you or we can show you how we can make sure that the process is moving correct. And I, um, you know, and you know, the 19, um, um, Lou Manan wrote a book about kind of the period in the late 19th century, early 20th century, uh, the Philosopher's Club, I think it was, which is kind of a similar story um, <coughs> of elites being very concerned about the kind of the, you know, the blood, ra wa raving, waving the bloody shirt and those sorts of things during the 1880s and 1890s, and how do, you know, college presidents and politicians and, you know, kind of the elite in society think about their role in messaging with the public about how the world works. Um, and so those are two cases where I think kind of things got under control. Unfortunately, the 1850s is not, <coughs> is not a happy story because um, that one went off the rails. Um, and um, I'm hoping we're more like the 1950s and the 1880s and 90s. If I, if I can add something on that, too, um, one of my current research interests is about an organization that started in New York called the Bureau of Municipal Research. Um, and they were involved in sort of good government research in New York City um, at the you know, 1890s, 1900, and so on. When you, you sort of, in your, in your mind, you have, uh, you know, from an election administration perspective, not the current problem of encouraging trust in elections, but the Tammany Hall problem of encouraging trust in elections. Right. Or there's a famous cartoon, you know, sort of you can vote for whoever, whoever you want as long as I control the counting, right? Yeah. And so, so how, do you, how do you deal with that? And in some sense, if an organization is all powerful in that sense, right, how do you transition towards better elections? Um, and the answer is that they're actually not all, 
people all the time, right? And that you get these splits for not just for you know, better running of elections, but a whole variety of political reforms in American politics, where some elites perceive their electoral interests as aligned with cleaning things up. And this is true also with the um, you know, formal regulation of, of party primaries, which wasn't a, always a thing and now is, um, is that was cleaning up and regularizing the process. And that people perceive it as a way of actually winning over voters in other places. And so some of the way out of this current problem comes from citizens saying, this is what we want our elected officials to sound like and do. And people who are going to work on these kinds of issues, yeah, maybe we'll vote for them. Right? And you don't have to get everybody. You just have to get enough to split the incentives. And as soon as you flip the elite incentives, then sometimes they'll do it because they're worried about what's going to happen to the country. But sometimes they'll do it because they want to get reelected. All right. So I think we'll go to one more question, which will come from uh, Dean Peterson. Prior to the 2020 election, states both red and blue had reasons for limiting vote by mail and drop boxes. Could some of the distrust be related to sudden changes, not necessarily outcomes? And I wanted to act, ask the academics on the panel for that. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, I've, so I've been writing about this recently, and um, I've been following things. I mean, I've been doing some TikToks of 2020 and just trying to see how um, and it is interesting that in like mm, February, March, there wasn't a whole lot of partisan division about what to do about the um, about the pandemic and what to do. And in fact, I mean, in fact, if you think about it, Ohio just to said, you know, <laughs> okay, everyone out of the pool, we're just going to mail you a ballot. So that was that was a Republican. Um, um, controlled state. Georgia as well. You know, we're just going to delay this boom. Um, we're just going to send every, you, know, you, you can apply for a ballot, ballot but, but that's what we're going to encourage people to do. And so there was a lot, there was kind of a synergy. And then you can begin to watch Democrats and Republicans kind of circling each other. So, um, and so there ended up being, I, as I characterize it, kind of the good government crowd, which consisted of Democrats and Republicans who were seriously concerned about getting this election, you know, there was gonna be an election even if the zombies were walking the streets and the, the, and, and, the, and the meteors were raining down on us. It was gonna happen and the serious people in the room were gonna make that happen regardless of your part, okay? There were political actors, um, and I won't get into details here because I don't wanna kind of get in that argument, um, happy to uh, during the break, but there were Democrats and Republicans who were also recognizing how, as someone once said, never uh, you know, you know, overlook the opportunity of a crisis, right? And, um, and so um, you know, there, there were political actors and some prominent ones who saw this as an opportunity to not only inc you know, to allow people to vote by mail, but to change the laws so that permanently we would all be voting by mail, for instance. That's just one example. Um, and then that, you can almost tick-tock it out day by day, week by week, as that discussion starts in state capitals, but especially in Washington, you can see the divisions begin to grow. Okay. Um, and um, so yes, I mean, I, I'm, I'm somebody, and my, my colleagues might disagree with me, but I think that, that you can peg some of the current divisions to how the voting during the pandemic ended up getting, um, you know, kind of getting handled at the political level. Um, I would still maintain <laughs> that in the core of that, there was still a lot of good government, right? I mean, I, I think most folks who are actually in the business of making the election happen, in fact, that's one of the striking things here. Most people actually responsible for making the election happen, which just had their head down. Um, but the political chattering classes saw this as an opportunity to do their political chattering class thing. Um, and it became an opportunity on both sides. Um, so we can talk more about that, but I, I think there's a good story to be told. About. I, I think the only thing I'd add to what Charles said is that fr from the perspective of the public, um, you know, when, when the, the pandemic started, what we know is that in crisis, people come together and they're willing to support stuff. And 
we, we, we've got this other psychological process that we all have called habituation, which means when we see something scary or terrible at first, we respond in that way where we all come together, but then we get used to it. And, um, and then there's a lot of space to re-engage in political divisions again. And, and, and so, so maybe part of what was happening there then is people got angry at, at opportunity-seeking moments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, since, since we're in California, the thing I would, the thing I would add here right, is underlying a lot of this was an assumption about who different vote modes was going to benefit, right? And um, the history of this in California is quite a bit different, right? Because um, there's an election in the 1980s where people go to bed uh, thinking that the Democrat has won and wake up in the morning as more uh, ballots have been counted, right? And discover that the Republican has won. And so this creates this perception that um, the, the voting by mail could benefit Republicans, right? And, and there, there was a period about 15 years ago when I first started getting interested in this where there was a big debate about um, whether forms of community voting should be expanded mail voting or whether it should be early in-person voting, right? And there was a sort of a period where people were trying to feel out, like, well, who's, who's gonna come out ahead if we, if we use these different, these different <coughs> methods, right? And uh, certainly, you know, that's, it's part of what goes on at the political level above the, above the election administration, right? Of you know, making a political decision about how, you know, what, what values to choose and so on. There, there probably is not a neutral way to always make those decisions, right? Because there will be consequences to some small amount, possibly, but potential consequences of the choices you make about how you conduct elections um, at the you know, sort of state legislative level. Well, I want to thank the panel, and hopefully people can join in with me and give them a round of applause. And um, before I call up the second panel, I wanted to paraphrase what uh, Chuck Levin said um, in statement, not necessarily a question here, of election administrators at the city, county, and state level, coast to coast, have done excellent work throughout our history. Keep it up and no apologies are necessary. So thank you all.